We'll do take two here. Okay, so so welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, I'm really excited to um, to launch a, a second module of of this course's discussion of kind of the mechanics and specifics of agent-based modeling. Um, we just finished uh, a survey of um, a really important area for agent-based modeling, which uh, concerned agent attributes or properties, characteristics of agents. And we talked about um, the central motivating role of heterogeneity within agent-based modeling um, and how that manifests in, um, uh, in individuals' static attributes, the attributes that don't change that are invariant, as well as attributes that evolve over time or their process, their location in certain and multiple processes. And we, and we talked about how agent-based models scale extremely effectively to represent heterogeneity, heterogeneity of three types, um, uh, three, three major types in terms of, of sort of their attributes or state. Number one, um, discrete quantities. So quantities where there's sort of this countable number of them, they could be categorical, they could be nominal, some cases they're ordinal, but there's a there's a discrete number. Continuous quantities, and and then finally relational quantities, quantities whereby um, it's a matter of relating, let's say, the agent, say a person, to another another component of the model, another factor in the model. It could be um, to a provider, a, a physician. It could be to an organization. It could be to another person, et cetera. We represent those for agents and um, those things can evolve uh, for agents. Um, uh, but that ability to represent those in a scalable fashion and in a fashion that allows us to add them and remove them nimbly um, in very localized changes um, really gives agent-based modeling um, particular power or individual-based modeling particular power. But really there was nothing in that description that pointed to what in some ways is arguably the most important aspect of, of uh, defining aspect of agent-based modeling, certainly compared to other individual-based methods. Uh, and that is, the capacity for agents and agents in the environment to interact. The discussion we, we've had would hold just as well for other traditions of individual-based modeling like micro simulation, where you have agents evolving over time, but where for a great number of micro simulation models, there's no interactions between agents. And indeed many micro simulation models run one agent after the other, after the other, um, uh, sort of run them through their life course, for example, um, without capturing meaningful interactions between the agents. There are exceptions to that, but but many mi micro simulation has a long and rich tradition of simulating uh, individual agents one at a time, for example. Um, and today, in the second module, we're going to be talked about one of these defining features of agent-based modeling, this focus on generating behavior for the model as a whole from the interactions of different agents. Agents of similar times, kinds and agents of different times, uh, types. And we're particularly gonna talk in this uh, introduction to this second module on agent, agent, agent environment interactions about uh, a particular mechanism of interaction, and indeed a mechanism of, of capturing relationships between agents that harks back to relational attributes, namely the presence of networks. So we're going to be discussing for this lecture and for next, networks. Uh, network characteristics, the ways in which structure of networks dictates um, the dynamics that are observed, um, the structure at runtime, as it were, the, the behavior. Um, and uh, we'll be seeing that the issue of, of representing networks in agent-based modeling is, is far from a, a trivial one. Um, there's many aspects of it to be discussed, ways in which networks serve as conduits of influence, 
spread of pathogens, spread of knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, ideas, et cetera, innovations. Uh, but also um, the ways in which uh, different relationships and networks differ in their, their time duration and other features from um, the, the particular kind of quanta or, or little bits of influence that spread on them. And we'll see there's a couple, <clears throat> two main models for that we'll be discussing. Now, beyond this, uh, we'll see that there's different varieties of networks. Some networks are weighted, for example. There's a weight between connections. Sometimes they're directional. I'm A is connected to B, but B may not be connected to A, for example. Um, there may be dynamics uh, on the networks, whereby the network evolves over time um, as partner change occurs or as people switch companies at which they work or what have you. But we'll also be talking about motivations for representing these networks. Networks are certainly all the rage. Um, uh, there's uh, a, a deep and, uh, and fascinating whole field associated with social network analysis to which we've contributed um, that secures great insights in the health area as well as many other areas from understanding network structure. But I do wanna talk about why we represent networks in agent-based models and dynamic models more generally um, and reflect on motivations for that. These slides are posted, so if anyone would like to get them on the Canvas site, uh, you're welcome to do so. And as I noted in my uh, opening moments, as people were still filtering into the virtual room here, um, we will be using any logic, either in the small or in the large, uh, in this session. So uh, now will be a good time to call it up. And now will be a good time to download one of the example models. Um, so I'm going to switch to my... Uh, to my screen sharing capacity and let's jump in. Um, so we're gonna be talking about um, uh, networks and network structure today. And I'd like you to load in a model called SEIR model of <laughs> illustration. Sorry, I'm um, sometimes I, uh, I lack um, inspiration for my names. Um, this is on the Canvas site, um, and uh, you'll find it uh, in the example models area of Canvas there. Um, uh, now, uh, maybe I'll, I'll just go and, and show that um, so you can easily, uh, easily find it. Um, uh, it's this SEIR model illustration. It should be the second to last one in those uh, models for interactive use in class. Okay, so if you were to download that and open it up, you will not see this. This is a, a different model, which I'll probably be discussing at some point. Um, uh, but uh, I will get it loaded up on my side um, and uh, it should be, um, should be this one, I, I, I believe. Okay, this is, uh, this is a little bit, um, crazy that uh, it, it has a different name here. Let me, um, no, it's not. Okay, I, I stand corrected. I, I thought I already had it loaded, but I don't. So I will go like you and, and download it here. Um, so uh, boom, and come on. Okay. And we have it down there and now let's go open it. Great. Um, okay, so um, uh, this is a model in which um, we're going to have a appropriate for many people's interest in the audience of this course, so spread of infection uh, in our classic categories, susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered. Um, but what's going to, to differ here is that people are placed into networks. Um, people differ in several attributes, including income, a continuous quantity, but um, more to the point for this lecture, they are placed in networks. And if we, if we go to Maine and we look at properties of Maine, if you scroll down, you'll find that 
people are defined to be in a distance based network where any pair of people, person A, person B, are connected if and only if person A and person B live within 75 distance units of, of each other, okay? And the units of distance are, are shown sort of up here, um, uh, but it's, I believe it'll be, you know, seven, seven and a half of these, of these squares here. Um, okay, uh, so if we go run this, um, we will find people uh, placed in space randomly and uh, with uniform likelihood uh, density at, at different locations. And we'll find uh, two people hitched up if they look close to each other and not hitched up uh, otherwise. So, so this uh, network exhibits this pro, pro, pro pink, pinquity effect whereby two people are likely to be connected if they live close together, or to flip it another way, they're more likely to live together if they're connected, the two are associated. Um, uh, and you'll find individuals of, of different state, such as illustrated with their, their color, um, connected uh, at any one time, and people's state will evolve in the context uh, of this network. And if you run the network, uh, many times, particularly with one of these larger populations, um, let's say this, this large population here, uh, we'll find that there's a, a spread of uh, infection, which will occur in the network. Some uh, individual here begins exposed and there's a spread of infection. And um, although I won't go into it, um, people's location here on the y-axis is, is uniformly distributed. Their location on the x-axis is based on their income. So people further to the right have, uh, are well healed. They're, they have, they're people of means. People to the left um, uh, have lower income. And there's a, a log normal distribution on income, which induces a, uh, a crowding over here at the left. And uh, if anyone's interested, you can go find videos of us building these networks within uh, boot camps, but or building these these this particular model or something close variant. But you'll see that income for the population is log normally distributed, and you'll see that people's initial location is um, is based on uh, if it's if crowding is income based, then it's based on five times their income. Otherwise, it's 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 just uh, chosen randomly. Um, for our case, uh, crowding is income based, and therefore going to be based on their income, and their y location is is uniformly distributed. Okay. Um, so uh, we have a a network. It looks something like this, and there was a spread of infection over the network. People exposed neighbors in the network uh, periodically uh, if they were themselves infective and if those neighbors happen to be susceptible, they could get infected themselves and, and thereby eventually become infectious and spread it onwards. People's communication of the infection is to a neighbor in the network. We'll go um, just see where that's captured here. Uh, so within person, we see that in the infective state, uh, beyond being able to progress to later states, such as via, um, what should be, should be called recovery. I don't know what's going on here. That should be called, uh, you know, uh, completing latency. Um, there's a contact within infective at a certain contact rate, whereby people send to a randomly connected person, a person connected to them in the network, an infection message. Um, and that leads them to, to notify their other neighbors um, of their infection status. And if we go and we look and someone is susceptible, if they get receive said message or indeed any message, they will become exposed. So if there's another agent next to them who's susceptible and they receive this exposure message, they will automatically become exposed here. This is a model which uses networks. It's an agent-based model, uses networks, and where people's uh, uh, natural history of infection here, their state evolution, 
depends on the influence of networks. Um, the networks also are reflective of individual characteristics, in this case, income. The networks are placed in space and um, interact with that space, uh, being two people are connected if they're close together. Um, and uh, this gives a flavor of, of many uses of networks in agent-based models, um, impacting dynamics, serving as a conduit of influence, um, capturing aspects of heterogeneity, um, being related to the, uh, to the spatial layout of the model, et cetera. But let's, let's talk about this at a deeper level. Um, uh, you'll find this model, anyone who's, who's seeking to you know, build on, on, on models of influence and, and would like to use any logic, this may be of, of interest to you as maybe dozens of other models I've provided, but I'd like to go into this at, at least at a, at a somewhat deeper, deeper level. Um, and uh, you know, many health issues in the world, the primary focus of, of, of this course, you know, are marked by dyadic connections, connected connections from A to B. There's a dyad, someone from A to B, um, which uh, you know, these connections may represent uh, relationships, sort of modes of exchange or conduits, interaction mechanisms between distinct entities. Um, and, you know, we see these ubiquitously, right? Relationships within families or organizations or between people and healthcare providers, for example, social networks uh, between people of various sorts, whether online or in person, um, uh, you know, allied health professionals and clinicians with each other and then with patients, organizations, you know, linked together in terms of supply chains. So vaccine manufacturers sending doses of vaccines to health authorities here in Canada or what have you, um, to particular hospitals. Um, and, you know, it, it, it bears noting that um, we may have agents that are not people, for example, support animals, and they interact with persons. So, so networks um, are, uh, pronounced features um, of, of uh, the contextual context in which people, other agents, organizations uh, circulate. Uh, they're prominent features of, of the landscape. Um, and you know, in nature-based modeling, this ability to capture agent heterogeneity and agent uh, context uh, are key motivators for that agent-based modeling. And, and networks provide this way of capturing relational heterogeneity, uh, these relations between people and in context. And you know, often there's motivations for this, uh, contagion of pathogen or knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, memes, ideas, influence, innovation. Um, and they often uh, offer access to resources and influence perception. Um, and uh, well, we'll be talking about networks uh, sort of in a more general way about their sort of their mathematical structure, really dealing with with simple networks where we either have a directed connection from A to B or not, or excuse me, an undirected connection from A to B. It bears noting that um, many networks in the world are not not purely um, unidirectional, where there's no distinction from a connection from A to B, but have other structure. Some are trees. So for example, you might have patients connected to a healthcare provider um, in a way that isn't having connect, not, not having any cycles in it. Um, it's, it's just patients with their providers and maybe providers with organizations but there's no, no cycles. Um, uh, you can have weighted connections. So connections that might have themselves heterogeneity reflecting the fact that some are very frequent, uh, high traffic connections, um, you know, high importance connections in terms of the number of contacts, the frequency of contacts, the, the, the causal impact of those contacts and others are, might be smaller. There are directed networks, whereby again, A to B is not the same as B to A. Um, 
You might say, I have a directed relationship, for example, from myself to my mother. Um, uh, I have a relationship of being her son, but she does not have a reciprocal relationship of the same sort directly with me. Um, and uh, networks can be, some networks have higher level structure associated with the rules of connection. Um, I'm not sure I'd describe it actually as higher level. They, they may have certain constraints on connections. So you may have providers shown here uh, in a memorable model of, of um, provider uh, patient trust and relationships and relationship building where we have providers uh, shown in, in this iconic image and, and patients who are shown with the um, with these circles. And there's a relationship between them that's exercised over time. And um, that relationship is associated with an attribute of trust. So a given person, well, a given patient will have a some degree of trust with respect to a particular provider. So this is a network, for example, that is at once a weighted network. We have trust associated with certain connections. It's also a network which uh, is bipartite. So uh, any, any um, I think this is, uh, no, no, actually I'm wrong. I'm, excuse me, um, I was thinking it was bipartite. It would be bipartite if, if individual uh, patients could only be connected with providers and providers only with patients. But in fact, uh, that's not the case. We see, um, we see, for example, patients connected with other patients. So it's not, in fact, a bipartite network. Um, patients can be connected with, uh, with patients as well as providers. Uh, and providers, it looks like, can be connected. Uh, no, they, uh, yes, they can be connected with other providers, too. OK. Um, Let's talk though about some motivations of re representing networks. Why, okay, given that we can represent these and given the diversity of types, why would we want to? I alluded to this earlier, but I wanna go into a little bit more specificity. Um, so uh, in a way, this slide, which is rather busy, but I tried to, to put it for overall view on one slide. Um, the motivations here in some ways represent motivations for including certain factors in dynamic models in general and in agent-based models. So I enumerated for you some motivations why you might want to represent something within a model as opposed to leave it out. Some things for you to think about, do we need this in the model? Um, one of those motivations was if it's essential for capturing certain dynamics that you're interested in, without which the model just wouldn't have credibility or, or, or um, you know, essentially characterize robustly the phenomena so that when you ask what if questions, you're, you have confidence in it. Uh, another thing was representing different outcomes uh, within the model according to that parameter. So maybe we want to reflect the fact that that um, you know, our, our uh, interventions may have different impacts on the periphery of a network. Maybe it's a school network involving uh, mental health distress in, in high schools. And we wanna understand the degree to which an intervention affects those at the core of the network, maybe the most popular people in the school, the most popular kids in the school, as well as the periphery. You know, kids that are are marginalized or bullied or what have you, and 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 don't have many friends. So we want to understand the the impacts on different areas of a network. Maybe that's of central interest. In other cases, we might want to intervene in a way that takes advantage of that structure. So another motivation for including something in a model in general is if it's needed to effectively represent your interventions. And interventions here um, might be informed by the structure. For example, you want to intervene perhaps um, with uh, peer education about bullying uh, amongst those at the center of the network, perhaps. Um, or, or maybe you want to perform contact tracing, which is about as network informed as you can get, right? You, 
you're, you're trying to trace down who is someone in contact with, and you're asking, you're eliciting information about their network, who they've had contact with, or, or a network, a, con, a particular type of contact network. Um, maybe your, your interest is in helping to avoid the spread of TB between remote communities, and you want to focus perhaps on those moving between communities who might be who might carry active TB disease. So you you focus in on on certain individuals based on their role in the network, moving from one connected component to another, one area of the network to another, one community in the network to another, and there you know some of the most uh, frequent. Um, folks who move back and forth. Maybe it's a salesperson, or maybe it's a uh, community member seeking out chronic care in a, in a different area in the city. Um, or maybe you want to intervene um, in the network in a way that alters the network. And there's some fascinating work here. But it's also work that, if you consider more broadly, it's, it's fairly widespread. Um, uh, so for example, you know, many types of interventions focus on support groups, putting in place support groups uh, for individuals. That's network building, right? You're, you're, you're extending their network with others who might support them. The ARCH program, the Addictions Recovery Community Health Program, focuses on building up networks between individuals and you know, uh, those with expertise in criminal justice related issues. And, uh, physicians in addictions medicine and uh, and you know physicians who can who can help them from a primary care perspective, nurses uh, and and generally connect them with housing resources, community organizations providing housing uh, and providing um, help on the, uh, the the employment side. So this is about network building. You're building up structure, building up social capital on people's parts. Um, uh, and you know, there's other networks that seek to provide people with buddies for particular dangerous situations. Maybe it's para consumption of narcotics. Um, these are, are methods that build up network structure um, for people. So certain types of interventions intervene on the network. They achieve their effects through networks. And you know, it behooves us to, to kind of represent the networks to capture those effects in our model. Um, in other cases, you, know, you are intervening in a way that the influence of that is mediated by and affected by the, the network. For example, maybe uh, we're involved with work with the chat safe guidelines in Australia. And there, you know, the goal is to build awareness on an individual's parts of, um, of the need to, um, um, to, be, to be cautious in, in how they respond to emotionally laden messages that might be distressing. Um, so things like about uh, suicide attempts or, or, or occurrence of suicide. Um, but also to, to compose messages themselves that are, are um, supportive and that reach out to individuals who may be undergoing a very tough time in, in supportive ways. So ChatSafe is a program that works on uh, to, to influence people, to influence their behavior on social media. And so it's, it's mediated by the network. Its impact is mediated by the network. And if you want to simulate the effects of variants of chat safe, you know, investing more in this emphasis or that, or extending it with, with um, some additional mechanisms, you're gonna really wanna represent that social network in which they're engaged because that's mediating the influence. Um, and there may be particular st structural aspects of that network you wanna take into, into account. Uh, or needle exchanges to reduce needle sharing. So interventions, in, in the modern era, often work through uh, work through networks. Um, there are reasons for capturing dynamics within networks. Um, and there's a shallow, what I consider a quite shallow part of the literature um, that uh, I've seen in the aggregate literature, which basically says, look, um, networks are great, they're fun, but um, we can take an aggregate model and calibrate it um, 
to an agent-based model with different network structure. Yes, networks affect dynamics, but we can capture all those effects within our aggregate model. So by implications, we may not really need to represent networks. Um, we, we, we could represent them just by uh, essentially imp implicitly represent them by changing parameter assumptions by you know having I'm the contact okay. rate go higher for a scale free network for example that this is a, a line of thinking which i've seen and i consider it a very shallow line of thinking that uh is not um really engaging with the substantive issues mentioned here that are big motivations for networks but not even with the dynamics issues if you really look at the differential dynamics of different network types, it is not merely, and I emphasize this again, and it's not merely that some types accelerate the spread and other types are slower, and therefore you can capture its effect in a mass action model and a model of random mixing with, with a parameter. If it were that simple, um, a lot of the need to represent um, uh, networks would, or the, the need to represent them will be lower. You'd still have these other needs, but it wouldn't be as pronounced there. But the fact is that you can get pronounced differences in the dynamics of your model with different types of network structure um, uh, that are not merely differences in speed, but sort of qualitative differences in, in um, the, nat the, the nature of those dynamics. And I particularly highlight when you have um, stochastic effects over scale-free networks versus random networks, these effects can be very important at a practical level. So in a scale-free network, um, if you have occasional connections, let's suppose you're dealing with TB in a remote community and you have um, uh, scale-free networks, I'd point to the to the work of my former postdoc, uh, Assad al Azem, for example, in this. Uh, you will you'll have um, uh, perhaps occasional outbreaks of TB. And if it's a scale-free network, what will tend to happen is you'll they'll, they'll sort of piddle around for a little bit, and then it will hit a network hub, someone who's highly connected in the community. It will just explode. And if you're waiting for sort of a gradual ramp up of infection to, to mobilize health resources, to get public health nurses on site to set up the contact tracing teams, you're going to be caught flat footed. You're going to be caught unaware because what happens in a scale free network is it just explodes with the force of a bomb and it, it disseminates. And then you get it going off at all sorts of places where it's in a random network a Poisson random network, as we'll see, it will it'll spread in a way that's uh, slower and more, or, or that's uh, more, um, uh, more sort of classically based on, on mass action spread, sort of based on, on uh, connections between individuals that are, that are less structured. And you won't get that sudden explosion. So there really are differences in dynamics seen in different networks um, qualitatively that you often will want to represent. It's not merely a matter of tweaking a parameter. Um, and uh, you know, if you're interested in a model where you're, you're interested in how certain antibiotic resistant uh, pathogens spread, for example, um, or the spread of certain, uh, uh, certain lineages for COVID-19 or the spread of specific attitudes or knowledge or beliefs or innovations, um, ideas, uh, you really will, will definitely want to capture uh, that in a, in a network structure to kind of capture its, its spread. So I spent a while on this slide, and I did so um, to get you to think through some, some um, compelling reasons for representing networks. Um, uh, and I've tried to, to list them as best I can. This is not exhaustive. I will highlight, and it was my bad, I, I didn't get it in there, perception and influence on networks. The fact that I may not take seriously the need to get vaccinated until several of my connections um, have caught COVID-19 um, uh, is, is also important. The fact that 
We have situated agents that learn about the world, learn about risks, judge those risks through networks um, is, is often extremely important. And yet another motivation I'll need, really need to, to add it to here is you get network heterogeneity. So you have things like people who have skeptical attitudes about vaccines tend to cluster together in a network. Um, and if you assume that they're randomly distributed among the population, um, you're going to be misled in your results. Often they will cluster. Um, they may cluster in ways that lead to much higher risk of infection in some areas of the network, where it's comparatively low in another. It's kind of like if you had um, an area of a forest and you know you had uh, some of the forest uh, being wet um, and the wood is wet and other wood being bone dry, it's gonna make a really big difference if the bone dry wood is scattered amongst the, the, the wood that's wet, <laughs> you know, just, just spread occasionally among the wood that's wet, uh, here and there you get bone dry pieces, or if the bone dry pieces are all concentrated in certain areas, that, that's a much more flammable situation because one spark in that area could cause an outbreak. And, and so it is with networks. Um, okay. Um, uh, within within um, agent-based modeling, dynamic modeling, we're, we're seeking to capture posited, postulated causal, um, causal uh, processes, causal pathways within our models. Um, we want to ask what if questions about counterfactuals often to, and to ask, you know, what will be the impact of this intervention or that intervention we've never undertaken before. And in order to do that in a reliable way, we need the influences in the model to be not nearly associational, but causal. And when it comes to networks, one of our premier interests for representing them is to capture influence, causal influence, causal pathways that operate over networks. There are exceptions, you know, maybe, maybe um, I want to simply have uh, a relational attribute in a, in a network that is simply bookkeeping based to record, you know, who's associated with what provider organization. Um, uh, and there's no causal influence there. It's sort of tagging people. But by and large, we tend to represent networks and agent-based models to capture the spread of influence across the networks. Sometimes it is pathogen. Sometimes it is perception of risk. Um, sometimes it's aspects of imitative behavior, knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, spread of ideas, innovation, et cetera. But there's, there's often a contagion process, a process that operates through that network. How do we capture that with an agent-based models? Well, there's two, two paradigms, one of them particularly dominant, which is uh, the use of messaging. Um, so we, we spread influence by having one agent send a message to another. Let's go back to that example model, if we might. And you may recall where we saw that the nexus of influence from one person to another lay in this, uh, this uh, linkage here, this here linkage. Um, and in that linkage, at a certain hazard rate, a certain contact rate, a chance per unit time per day in this case, um, we had one agent send to another a message. This is what I mean by messaging. We're capturing the spread of influence via messaging. And you may recall that that was one side of, the, of, of this connection, but it does take two to tango. And the other side was right here. This person would transition. If, if the person received that message, so this is being sent to a random connection person, if that other person, distinct person, who happens to be susceptible, and they receive that message, they will 
unconditionally move here. In many cases, we make it you know, based on a flip of a coin or something, but here they unconditionally move. So this is a prima facie example of messaging being used to spread influence um, uh, across a network, uh, in this case, across connections within that network. Um, so this, is the, this is the dominant approach um, uh, for good. My internet connection is unstable. That's uh, un, unsettling to, uh, to say the least. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, okay, we'll, we'll just have to watch this. Um, if I, uh, wait, you're not uh, online, are you? I am, but I can get online. No, 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 no. That's actually good. If you could. Oh. Huh. Ladies and gentlemen, we, uh, Houston, we have a problem. Um, we have a fire alarm here. Um, okay. Uh, I, I'm going to, by, uh, according to the codes, evacuate the building. So, um, I'll be back. Okay, my my apologies. Um, uh, I'm going to pause in the recording. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah. So again, apologies to the remote folks. Um, uh, it was probably a once a year sort of thing. Um, so uh, I've been speaking here about you know, considerations with, with networks, motivations for them, types of networks. Um, I also want to, to discuss something that I really haven't seen explicitly mentioned in any discussions I'm part of, um, but which, which um, ends up bearing in a significant way on model design and implementation in HBase modeling. Um, and in order to, to sort of clarify this point, I, I, I want to first by making one general observation, which is that networks um, are often defined by the relationships or, or behaviors associated with the relationships that they capture. So, you know, an example here is a given person might be enmeshed in multiple networks. I mean, they typically are, right? A family network, a collegial network, a patient physician network, perhaps. So I may be a physician or I may be a patient and I'm, I'm in that network. A sexual network, network of sexual context, a needle sharing network for intravenous drug users, perhaps a dealer user network. You know, maybe this this, uh, this person who used drugs um, seeks out dealers and they go to certain dealers. They may be a client of a certain community organization. Um, and they may be uh, part of a network that was carried out for contact tracing, maybe for HIV AIDS uh, spread ID via IDU or maybe through or via intravenous drug use or maybe contact tracing for COVID-19 or what have you. So it bears noting that there's not one network. There, you know, the, the, it's not like we have handed to us some in some predefined privileged way that a person is a member of a network. No, in fact, there's different networks of relevance for different purposes or different needs. And those networks are often associated with certain types of relationships or behaviors that they capture. Um, you know, sexual behavior for the sexual network, needle sharing or need a drug use behavior for intravenous drug use for needle sharing, et cetera. Um, and uh, I, I want to to sort of advance this to this next realization and point. I want to emphasize that often in these networks, each of them has some notion or many of them certainly will have some notion of, con of contact. So in a sexual network, the notion of contact of concern uh, may be you know, a sexual encounter. Um, it could, by contrast, uh, uh, be a, uh, a partnership. You could think of that as your 
sort of level of contact, but you know, the forming of a sexual relationship. Um, but uh, in a needle sharing network, you might also, you know, have a notion of contact, which is sharing needles. Um, in a dealer user network, there might be, you know, a particular transaction between a dealer and a user. Uh, and, you know, in a, a patient physician network, it might be a, an episode of care, you know, case where a person seeks out a, a physician, um, for example. Uh, to, to about a concern. Um, now, here's the thing, and, and this bears on the design and follows through to the implementation of agent-based models. When you have these relationships between parties, you know, I'm your physician, or I'm your brother, or, um, you know, I'm your colleague, or what have you, often, the interactions over that network are not are 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 different in their character, uh, in their duration, their 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 um, uh, the diversity than the relationship itself. So um, you know there might be a relationship between a user and a dealer in a drug use network for, or a drug a procurement network. But particular interactions will occur that will be transactions, purchase of drugs or something. In a sexual network, there might be a relationship in place between two parties. It's a sexual relationship, but there are particular encounters that, that make up the, the interactions. Um, Physician-patient network, similarly. Um, uh, and so often we have this distinction between the relationship or connection per se, and then the interactions over it. Not always, like with a family network, it's it's maybe not so easy to disentangle those. Um, um, you could argue there's some interactions there or lack of interactions too, but, but with some, it's very, very clear. Um, and depending on your model purpose and your model time scale, relative to so the time horizon of the model, relative to the duration of these interactions, you know, you, you might treat um, uh, particular interactions as, as, you know, reflecting a persistent connection, just treat it as those two are always connected. So maybe it's a family network. And you, you obscure, you know, you get away from the details of, how often does Joe call his mother or something? And you just deal with the fact that there's a supportive relationship there. Um, or maybe you have your know, roommates and in, in, in a in a home, and there's a spread of imitative behavior or of norms between them, and you treat it as a continuous relationship. Um, in some cases, there could be literal flow of material, for example, between them. But in other cases, you know, you might might be interested in representing discrete interactions. So uh, here you might, might want to represent, I'm not saying you will represent, I'm saying you could represent occurrences of needle sharing or episodes of care seeking, whereby there's stigmatizing language used or you know, uh, cases of physical proximity that allows a risk of transmission or vaccine shipments that arrive in a tranche or sort of an allotment of vaccines that arrive and are then distributed. So, you know, there's an important question in model scope. On to what degree do you just treat it as a continuous connection? You, you hide the details of the interactions. You just say it's an influence or, or it has some risk associated with it on a per day basis or what have you, or, or treating it discreetly. And there's no one right answer here. It depends on the purpose of your model. Which do you get into? Just be aware that some models will say, oh, there's a sexual partnership from A to B and the probability given a discordant partnership between someone who's HIV positive and HIV negative, the probability per month of transmission is you know, 20% or something like that. Um, by contrast, some will actually represent particular occurrences where you know condoms are or are not used or what have you. Um, 
uh, so representing the fact that sometimes those encounters may occur you know, in an intoxicated state where condoms are not used, in other cases they are based on power relationships between the parties, et cetera, you know, risk of transmission. So some models uh, and some agent-based models, you may just treat it as a continuous factor that influences and, and not get into the details of the interactions and others will represent the details of the interactions. And you know, important scope choice is at which level to represent it. Um, you know, do you need to represent specific occurrences, or do what to what degree can you just represent the relationship? In general, it's advised to start simple, and representing the relationship may be there, but you should be thinking there may be certain aspects of your intervention which mean that it really is useful in some cases to represent. Um, particular encounter uh, in, in order to capture the effect of an intervention or, or to, to get certain statistics characterized, et cetera. Um, okay, so we're almost done with this kind of overview of issues with networks. Um, I do want to note just one or two other things before we start diving into some particular networks. And network structures um, as mathematically and statistically characterized. So here's the thing. Um, some networks are, um, are, are sort of more primal than others. Um, some are what I would like to call derived or fabricated. They're kind of, that's not the right word for it, but they're they're a um, derived quantity. They're a, uh, a result of more simple things. They're composite networks. Maybe that would be another approximate term. Um, so some networks are the results of superimposing simpler networks um, in, in day to day life. Uh, Wade will recognize this here because it's from one of his many contributions. Um, this is a model of, of pertussis. Uh, look at the impact of maternal immunization. Um, and what we have here is individuals um, shown as these black dots uh, represented in the context of households. You'll notice there's, for example, two individuals associated with this household um, uh, and you know several individuals, three, I think associated with this household, et cetera. And then we have schools, and those are shown in the so the, the households were kind of the black um, uh, black bordered uh, squares, and the schools are the blue squares. And you notice schools may be associated with many individuals in the model. The smaller dots, fittingly enough, mostly because they're children. And uh, and here we have a school network. So we have a home network. We have a school network as well. Um, and then we might have some contacts in the background community that are just occurring that, that link some people up. Maybe they're part of the same knitting club or the same curling club or, or what have you. Um, uh, they go to the same sports bar or what have you. Um, so you could talk about the network as a whole here. Um, you know, who, who has a contact with who? You could create a, a mixing matrix where the rows and columns are people, the same people in the rows and columns. And you have one with, is that person in contact with another uh, through any mechanism and a zero otherwise. Um, and that would in some sense be a composite network, a, a compound network, a derived network from, from these more basic networks. Um, and uh, these more basic networks, uh, you know, might might have a certain structure and orderliness to them that is lost when you aggregate up to the overall network. For example, schools will be, you'll have contact there between people of certain age groups. And maybe in some cases you'd represent classrooms and that classroom would show disproportionate contact between a certain age, within a certain age group, you know, a, a defined smaller age group. And that has a certain structure to it. Homes have certain structures that are well-defined. And yet when we aggregate up to the overall network, 
and we just summarize it as person by person, you know, a lot of that structure may be submerged. It's, it's mixed together. It's sort of superimposed on other structure. And it, it may actually allow for neater characterization, crisper characterization, simpler characterization as a superposition of two highly ordered networks. Just be aware of that. So, so there may be times where dividing it up and describing it as a sum of different networks or a combination is actually much simpler because each of those networks admits to a simpler description, excuse me. Um, so that's one thing to reflect on. But another thing that's, that's important to realize is that networks, I, I, I found many, many people with an agent-based modeling, many students coming to agent-based modeling um, will sometimes um, uh, assume that networks in the model are to be represented exogenously, is sort of imposed on the model um, and, and characterized um, as a feature of the underlying situation. But there are times, and often that's the case, but there are times where the networks we observe from the world, the networks on which we may have empirical data, say data on case contact networks during COVID-19 or for intravenous drug users or for TB, um, uh, of rather different sorts there, but um, for those, um, the networks might be more fruitfully thought of for certain needs as emergent phenomena. So a, a case contact network is a, uh, a case in, in point. Um, uh, so contact tracing is not a random sampling process. It's not a representative sampling process. There's a contact tracing protocol that occurs that ends up playing out over an underlying network of some sort, one or more underlying networks. Um, and that ends up eliciting, that ends up gathering these nodes and edges, which make their way into a contact tracing network. Um, so you may perform tracing, you may further trace back from a person only under certain conditions. So maybe in a, uh, in contact tracing for COVID-19, um, uh, if there's a COVID-19 positive case, you ask who their contacts were, you contact those. And if, if that contact um, tests positive, maybe you will further contact trace them. And so you end up expanding successive for positive contacts, but maybe you wouldn't trace someone who is negative, test negative. Um, that would be, you only collect it over, or only a, uh, under certain conditions. Um, or very common for other areas in the COVID-19 pandemic, maybe I trace a case who's positive and has symptoms. But if I find one of their contacts who's positive, I first ask before determining whether I trace them, are they, are they symptomatic? If the answer is no, they may be positive, but they're asymptomatic, maybe we don't trace them. That was going on for a while here in this very province to the province's, uh, uh, province's disadvantage. Um, the point is contact tracing comes from a process. The contract tracing network comes from the process. The features, the rules under which that process plays out shape in material way, in big ways, the, the structure of this contact tracing network. It's very, fabricated network, it's a contingent network, it's a, it's a, a derived network. It is not you know, some underlying feature of the landscape, it is coming from a process that shapes its characteristics as much as the underlying you know, contact networks on which it operates. Um, so just be aware that when you're looking at networks like a contact tracing network, you should be thinking in your head to what degree is this something we just impose on the model? We presuppose that is the structure of the network. And to what degree is it something the model produces endogenously 
and we calibrate to the features of the contact tracing network. Um, where you know the contact tracing network is viewed as something that bubbles up from a contact tracing process rather than is just imposed on the model as the presupposition that it's the ground truth in terms of how how people interact. Um, so um, you know be aware that some networks that you may have access to on which you may have access to data for which you may have access to data need to be approached differently than others. Some are more um, are better equipped to just be um, used as as a presupposition of, of an underlying network structure. And others are more tangled up with, um, with emergent properties of some underlying process and where they may be more suitable for calibration. We're going to be discussing this difference between parameterization and calibration later in this course. But the big difference here is, is this a feature of the underlying model to be specified exogenously, or do we look for the model to generate it? Um, and uh, where the rules may affect it in, in big ways. Um, okay, um, so the derived nature of networks, uh, the fact that sometimes they're not, they're not um, inherent features of the situation, but rather derived features of, of an underlying system, a situation that may be characterized more simply through through characterizing the underlying processes needs to be borne in mind. I mentioned contact tracing as something that gives rise as an emergent phenomenon to networks, but there's many others. Mobility patterns are another one. And you know, in an agent-based model, um, you're going to need to draw a line about how far down you want to go. Maybe it would be simpler in some ways instead of representing a network to represent mobility. Um, uh, or represent the living situation in which people circulate, um, long-term care, assisted care, dormitories. Um, you know, maybe you want to represent that, and that ends up inducing a sort of network structure on contacts. Um, uh, or maybe you want to represent, like in work by Morris and Kretschmar, that was a, a great insight in the early 2000s, relationship formulation and dissolution to understand networks for STI transmission, sexually transmitted infection. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, thinking about how they result from, from processes of contagion can also be useful in things like snowball sampling. Anyway, um, the point is networks can be contingent. They can be um, derived. They can be emergent features of the situation. They can be the result of superimposing networks that are actually easier to represent as uh, uh, as individual quantities because they have simpler rules behind them. Okay, um, I'd like you to load in a model now, if I could. Um, uh, had the fire alarm not not interrupted us, we would have had more time to really complete this process, but we'll make do with what we can here for, for representing networks. So I'm just going to go up here to uh, another model, which I placed um, in the, in the uh, course site, and it's called, there we go, um, uh, it, is, it is this one right here. Um, SIRS model ABM and SD for alternative networks. Sounds good uh, for exploring alternative networks. Okay. So why don't you download that and get that loaded up here in any well. We're going to use this to explore the relationship between network structure, statistical summaries of said network structure, and the dynamics of processes operating over that network. In this case, dynamics of contagion. Okay. Um, so SIRS model ABM and SD for alternative networks. Now this model, moreover, is kind of a bonus. It includes a system dynamics model, a compartmental model too. Um, 
and uh, we'll be able to sort of look back and forth with a, an aggregate representation of these dynamics of this contagion phenomenon alongside a, an agent-based representation. Okay, so we're gonna have a population and the population will share characteristics with uh, an aggregate model. Um, so the population will be of a certain population size, there'll be a certain number of immigrants per month coming in, um, number of contacts per month and transmission contact with, uh, uh, per, you know, transmission contact per discordant contact, transmission probability. So if there's a contact between the susceptible and infective, um, what's the probability to be transmitted? There's a mean time to recover and a mean immunity duration. And if we go, here we see it for the aggregate model. If we go to, to person here, you'll see these as well. Um, and uh, you'll have analogs here and you'll, you'll see that this, these use the same underlying parameters, the parameters in main that are also used uh, for, oops, here we go. Um, for this aggregate model. Now, um, we've also got some outputs here and some of them will be discussed in later lectures, but um, one of them of central interest will be a histogram. And uh, the histogram is going to summarize um, for different population members, the number of connections that they have to others. We actually show two things in the histogram. We look for people in the population, the number of connections they have to others. And then, then to get you thinking, we actually show for their friends, what are, what's the distribution for their connections? Well, we'll, we'll talk about that more because it's an interesting conceptual feature of, of the network context that these are, are different. Um, so if we look at population members as a whole, and then we look and we summarize their connections versus the friends of those population members, you might think, well, it's the same population. How could it be any different? Well, um, it has to do with the nature of, um, of, of friendship and who you're likely to be connected to. We'll come back to that point. But first, let's, um, let's run the model if we could. So we'll go to baseline and we'll enact, ladies and gentlemen, this theory. Okay, so, so here we have a population, we, we have people starting infective, and it, in this case, it's going to be a network that is distance mediated, meaning um, two people here in particular will be in contact if and only if they lie within a certain distance of each other. And you can see the infection spreading over that network. And by scrolling up here, we can, we can see, um, sort of the, the number that's, uh, that's infective in the system dynamics model, as well as in the agent based model. And uh, if we compare this number infective in the agent based model versus the system dynamics model, the aggregate model, using the exact same parameters, can anyone say what's, do these strike you as similar or different? Can anyone describe, um, uh, a point of uh, of similarity and a point of difference. Anyone? How about a point of similarity? Both of them can start with a spike. Good. Both go up and then come down. Right. Okay. Good. Um, difference. How about differences? Anyone? Yes, wait. The S T curves are smooth, and the agent based model is. That's right. That's right. So the system dynamics curve is is smooth, and posits a very rapid, ooh, pronounced rise, um, and and decline. Whereas the agent based, um, agent based one exhibits a lot of these kind of crenulations, these kind of leaps up and down, and and sort of noisy. So that's good. Other features? The ABM one seems to go to zero. AB1, ABM one goes to zero. There ain't nobody infective anymore. Whereas the system dynamics one, where does it go in terms of infection? 
just under uh, like 50 ish like yeah yeah so it's it's stable just under 50 ish right um okay so uh there's some some differences now here we see for this network um we'll go to the the population this one here um what is this histogram telling us what's the single most common number um, of connections for a person to have here. Can anyone say? What does it look like? I'll tell you that to read these things off, like the bar is shown, the, this value corresponds to like this, uh, uh, this uh, number here, I believe. Um, uh, this is two, uh, excuse me, this is four. Um, I think this is four, this is three, this is two, this is one. Okay, I'm I'm confused. But roughly speaking, uh, it's this one here, right? So it, it looks like six. Um uh and in fact the 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 mean number here is uh is nine. So it you know we have the, the single largest number here, but the mean number is nine. Um you'll notice friends a little bit different. Can anyone say there's what what's the difference in this and this? Which one is larger? Friends. Yeah, friends. Now we'll come back to this point next time as we're talking about some mathematical structure of these networks. Uh, but I want you to muse on that. Why would friends? Why would there be more? Con if if we if we do a histogram, we characterize the distribution of connection counts among friends compared to among population members as a whole, why would it be higher among friends? We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, I'd like you to think about that uh, over the weekend. But yeah, here we have a, a big difference in the eventual uh, spread here. Now, if we were to uh, increase this, this size here, um, uh, so we have a population size of a thousand, um, and if we were to increase it to ten thousand, we might see a um, you know a difference here, right? Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put it to ten thousand here, and I'm going to run it. What do you think would change if I set this to be a ten thousand population? Anyone besides it running slower? What what else would change besides the ABM running slower? Would the speed of the agent base or of the system dynamics model change? Anyone? No, this will not change. No, it won't change because it's just bigger numbers in it, right? Um, so we start with 9,999 susceptible. Now, my computer is really working and hopefully it won't impair the, uh, uh, the, the recording here and so on. But um, it's taken a while to, to wire up this network. This is a well known phenomenon. Uh, it's also an extremely dense network because we're packing them into the same space. We'll come back to that point and why changing just the population number naively like that is often not what you simply want to do, but um, we're going to have a very dense network. Um, I think had the fire alarm not gone off, we could have waited for this, but I think I'm, I'll leave that for you to do. Uh, from the uh, convenience, the comfort of your home. Um, and uh, oh, it's out of memory, no wonder. Okay, so I'm going to go here. I'm sorry, I'm going to go to baseline and I'm going to set it to be, okay, this is going to be um, using, using some memory. Maybe we'll give it one more try here. Okay, so I've, I've upped the population to to 10,000 and we'll see if here uh, there's enough memory. This is a spontaneous uh, plan on my part, but hopefully we'll, we'll get some results. So what, how would we expect the dynamics to change if we have a larger population? Can anyone say it has a couple of big implications? What would be one thing? Anyone? Anyone? I'm gonna go up to the console, and make sure we're not out of memory this time. Can anyone say? Is it 
sorry, I guess what type of network is it? Is it purely distance based? Uh, then it's going to spread a whole lot more because there's so many people all all together. Yeah. So there's each person. You notice that it's not only a distance based network. It's put into the same space. So the density of it is extremely high. So each person will have a lot more possible connections to whom they could spread. Now, that doesn't mean that they're spreading it to all of them, um, you know, that they're spreading it at a faster, sending it to many more connections, uh, each, uh, they're spreading their pathogen, but it's a much greater diversity of people. Um, to whom they are they are are, are sending it um and uh as a result um it will uh, it will spread it will spread very widely in a less uh, restricted way and i think this is what you were getting at what's another difference here anyone what's another difference that we might expect to see if we have very very few people there's more effect of something that Wade highlighted in the ABM compared to the SD model. What is that? The effect of begins with an S. Yeah, it's it's stochastic. So so if we have a lot fewer people, there's more happenstance. It's sort of um, where the infection goes, et cetera. And um, uh, I think this is actually a model which uh, to really do justice to it, we would need to set that event aware solver to be false um, uh, here. But um, but yeah, there's there's gonna be a lot, a lot less um variability in uh, a really big population because it it's going to um be less chancy whether uh the number of routes from which A can transmit to B, they're less likely to be blocked by someone else who's previously recovered. Um uh, another effect uh, here will be that with the larger population, you're going to have um, a chance that the infection will persist and not die out because there's a lot more corners of the network at which it can persist. So I think we'll have to wait to, to see that next time. But I want to I want to draw your attention. I think I'll switch it back to a thousand. And I just want to draw your attention to the fact that um, you can readily change within this network. If we go to main, we can readily change the assumptions about the network structure. So if we go down main uh, to the space and network area, you'll notice that there's a choice here for, for network type. And right now there's a distance-based network with a certain connection range. Um, this can be changed to say a random network. Um, with uh, a random network, there's going to be uh, a different set of rules for whether people are connected or not. Um, uh, and particularly, we're going to have a certain probability of connecting any two, uh, any two people. Um, and, uh, and similarly, we could set it to a scale-free network or a small world network, et cetera. So um, in this case, we're going to be uh, going through a set of different networks with different parameters that we can, we can specify. And for each of them, setting the parameters in some similar ways. So, so we have similar numbers of connections between persons and observing what the difference is um, from other networks and from the aggregate model. So that's what we're going to be doing. Um, but as we do that, um, uh, I'd like you to also reflect on the fact that it's not merely a matter of how close it is numerically to the other model for this baseline case. Uh, a lot of the issues with representing networks are a matter of how do they, uh, you know, what role do they play in the goals of this, of this, um, of this model. To what degree do they play a key role in intervening in capturing the interventions you want to represent, in capturing the dynamics, in capturing the output information you want to cap you want to express, and allowing you to capture information for calibration, like with a case contact network, if you want to treat that as an emergent feature, et cetera. 
So bear in mind that while we will be comparing these against a random mixing model as captured in an aggregate form, um, uh, just because in some they will represent it doesn't mean the network is not playing a useful role. For your case, it may play a useful role for the research questions or problems that you're bringing to the table. Okay, so uh, regrets again about the um, the fire alarm, but um, I think we've we've covered a lot of the basics, and that puts us in a strong si strong situation to explore the balance of these slides most of which focus on this issue of comparing the structure, particularly as illustrated in that histogram of connections and the dynamics um, in terms of infection spread of these different elements. And it is to that task that we will um, bend ourselves in our next lecture. Okay, so thank you very much. And um, again, for those who didn't hear it, uh, I've just survived the one of the most entropic, uh, but also uh, packed weeks in, in memory. I appreciate your patience in helping me get through this. And I know I have a lot of sort of catch up work to do for this class, but um, hope to to do that uh, in the next few days. And we'll, um, we'll, we'll push things forward for your projects uh, in, uh, in, in the coming days as well. So thank you very much, and I'll look forward to having office hours with anyone who'd like to stay here.